Welcome. My name is Dan Sohm. I am Principal Scientist for Marketing at Y Technology. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar and to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Kushal Gupta of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kushal Gupta is a research assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, where his research covers many aspects of DNA transfer for gene therapy and genomic manipulation. He also serves as the director of the Johnson Foundation Structural Biology and Biophysics Corps, where his specialties include small angle X-ray scattering, small angle neutron scattering, analytical ultracentrifugation, X-ray crystallography, X-ray footprinting, molecular dynamics, and of course, light scattering. He has been at Penn for over 22 years as an undergraduate, a graduate student, a postdoctoral fellow, and now a research scientist. In addition to his scientific work, he is also involved in music education, outreach, arranging, and entrepreneurship. In this webinar, Dr. Gupta will present his work on the molecular mechanisms of HIV and HIV therapeutics, and the biophysical techniques that he uses to investigate their structure and mechanism of action. On behalf of Y Technology, I would like to thank Kushal for this presentation and for the excellent relationship we have had over the years. Now I hand the presentation over to you, Kushal. Hello everyone, my name is Kushal Gupta. I'm currently at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, and I direct the Johnson Foundation Structural Biology and Biophysics Core. I want to first thank Y Technology Corporation for this opportunity to tell you about my work and how much the technology has impacted my research. Today, I'm going to tell you about how important light scattering has been to my ongoing research of the HIV protein integrates and drug discovery efforts against this target. In the Johnson Foundation core, we rely upon an array of state-of-the-art instrumentation to facilitate the ongoing research of members of the Penn community, alongside investigators from nearby institutions and companies. Hands down, the most popular and productive workhorses of this toolbox day to day are our light scattering instruments all made by Wyatt Technologies. This includes our Dynapro Nanostar, our SecMols components, the Dawn Helios 2, and the T-Rex Refractive Interferometer, and our most recent acquisition, our CG Mols instrument, the Calypso 2. This technology has been a source of tremendous productivity for our research groups and our many users, as evidenced by the number of papers and funded studies that have incorporated some variety of light scattering over the past decade. For me, I've performed some several hundred SecMOLS experiments here at Penn over that time on a wide array of topical areas, including protein nucleic acid interactions, protein protein interactions, and the context of RNA splicing. HIV biology and drug discovery, site-specific recombination, and chromatin structure. Underlying the utility of these very important techniques are the first principles of light scattering, how light interacts with matter. We use these techniques to directly measure the increase in coherent scattering that occurs with the increase in mass of a biopolymer whether it be via macromolecular interactions between two molecules, such as a protein and a protein or a protein and nucleic acid. The phenomenon can be as simple as two monomers of a protein forming a dimer or more complex events like polymerization and protein aggregation. For those doing biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology, one of the most popular implementations of light scattering today is size exclusion chromatography in line with multi-angle light scattering simply known as SecMOLs. In this approach, the samples of interest are processed through a standard chromatography assembly with a sizing column that separates the macromolecules by their size. The alluent from the separation then proceeds into a multi-angle light scattering instrument, where there are multiple angles of light scattering recorded every second. The differential refractive index of this alluent is recorded afterwards to directly determine the concentration of the macromolecule at each time point. The light scattering information combined with concentration allows for a direct determination of molecular mass without the need for any standard curves or theoretical extinction coefficients. This information is commonly displayed as shown here. A double Y plot is a function of retention time. The determined mass is, is plotted across the UV or the RI chromatogram to reveal the determined mass of the alluding species at that time point. For any structural biologist, biochemist, or biophysicist, 
Light scattering and its various implementations, like dynamic light scattering and SecMOLs, has become a day-to-day -day prerequisite for success in the study of biological macromolecules. For those using de novo techniques like cryo-electron microscopy, X-ray crystallography, or NMR, routine analysis and batch-to-batch -batch validation of recombinant preparations are critical steps toward successful structure determination. For a small angle X-ray neutron scattering scientist like myself, it is almost impossible to reliably interpret experimental results without this key experimental measure in hand. For enzymologists characterizing the activity and inhibition of recombinant preparations, batch-to-batch -batch validations is key to accurate findings in the assessment of lead targets. Here is an outline for the remainder of my talk today. I first like to introduce you to my primary area of research, the enzyme HIV integrase and the ongoing need for drug discovery and structural study in this area. Then I will proceed to tell you about the situations within our ongoing research where light scattering analysis was key to successful outcomes in the application of another approach. I'll tell you a bit more about small angle scattering and how SecMOLS has been important to its application to the study of HIV integrase and its complex of host factors and DNA. Then I'll tell you more about how dynamic light scattering has helped us assess prospective lead compounds that are hits against HIV integrase. This will then be followed by some discussion of how key light scattering was to our recent breakthrough in crystallizing the full length intact HIV integrase protein with a new class of compounds called allosteric inhibitors of integrase, or all innies. The HIV AIDS pandemic remains a major global public health problem, with parts of the world recently experiencing dramatic increases in rates of infection. 37 million people worldwide are currently infected, with millions of new infections each year. Over 18 million of these individuals are on antiretroviral regimens, with that number projected to increase to 30 million by 2020. However, challenges in viral resistance and effective control handicap these efforts at treatment and motivate the ongoing search for novel therapeutics. This is a genome map of HIV, about 10 kilobases. These open reading frames that you see are all either potential or realized drug targets in the clinic. The HIV genome only encodes for three enzymes, protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. Integrase, the protein I'm going to tell you about today, is a 32 kilodalton protein produced by the protease cleavage of the C terminus of the pole open reading frame. Integrase is a three domain protein. It has an N terminal zinc binding domain, shown in green, followed by a catalytic core domain with conserved RNA's H like fold and DDE active site, shown in blue and a less well-conserved C-terminal domain that features an SH3-like fold. The most distinguishing feature of the recombinant HIV integrase protein is its propensity to self-associate and form oligomers, with everything from monomer to dimer and tetramer to even octamer having been reported based on a variety of techniques and a broad variety of experimental conditions. This propensity to self-associate has made the protein a very challenging structural biology target. It is generally difficult to express and purify without the use of excipients like high salt, glycerol, and the detergent CHAPS, and is highly prone to aggregation. While one, many one and two domain partial crystal structures of HIV integrase are now available, crystallographic structures of the full length protein, either alone or in complex with DNA, has eluded many investigators worldwide for many, many years. Integrase has two chemical activities, a three prime processing activity and a strand transfer activity that leads to the integration of viral DNA into the host genome, resulting in the formation of provirus. This higher order assembly of integrase in DNA, the intisome, is a site of action of a FDA class of approved compounds called the strand transfer inhibitors, or STIs, which block the integration step. The newest generation of these compounds have been informed by recent landmark cryo-EM structures and are being optimized to counter emerging drug resistance and to optimize drug half-life. So now that I've introduced HIV integrase, I'll next discuss the small angle scattering technique and how important SecMOLS has been to its application. 
The application of the small angle scattering approach to structural biology and solution biophysics has exploded over the past 15 years, with one to two new papers that employ the technique appearing in PubMed every day. Much like light scattering, this is an elastic scattering technique that derives rich information content from the measured angular dependent scattering. In this approach, a well-understood sample of macromolecules is scattered with a collimated beam of either X-rays or experimental neutrons. The resultant scatter is recorded and circularly averaged to yield a one-dimensional intensity profile plotted as a function of scattering angle. The data can then be subjected to an inverse Fourier transform analysis to yield a shape distribution function, which provides a description of the lengths of all the intertonic vectors within the scattering volume providing insight into the shape and spatial extent of the molecule. This information can then be directly compared to and modeled with available atomic structures as a rigorous test of structure, conformational state, quaternary structure, and composition in solution. However, if a sample is not physically or compositionally monodispersed, for example, aggregated, a mixture of oligomers, or contaminated, the interpretation of these results is greatly compromised. This is where sec malls has been critical to the growth and application of this technique. Here's an example. Shown here is an Astra strip chromatogram where different channels of data are shown for the sec malls analysis of a group 2 intron particle from Lactococcus lacti, a 440 kilodalton protein RNA complex. Preceding our application of SACs, we perform sec malls. While the particle appeared to be very singular by UV absorbance alone, the green line that you see, the light scattering data reveals the problems with the preparation. Severe aggravation at the void, as evidenced by the inline DLS shown in purple and the light scattering selected at detector 11. Had this particulate made it into the SACS experiment, the experiment would have been greatly compromised. We introduced an additional purification step to solve this problem, and this change resulted in its success, not only for our SAC study, but for the subsequent high-resolution cryo-EM structures that were determined afterwards. SECMALS had similar utility in our study of HIV integrase host factor interactions using small angle X-ray scattering. The host factor LEGF P75, that is lens epithelium derived growth factor, has a modest five helical bundle, colored here in purple, called the integrase binding domain because of its high affinity interaction with the catalytic and internal domains of the integrase, shown in red and green. This is a functional interaction very important to the integrase function and the viral life cycle. In our 2010 SAC study of co-expressed recombinant integrase legit oligomers, SECMALS was key to the success of that study, as we had to screen through many mutated and truncated forms of this complex to find preparations that were well-behaved enough for small angle X-ray scattering analysis at the synchrotron. This allowed for the collection of high-quality data to allow us to propose specific structural models for LEGF-bound leg integrase touchmers in solution. Shown in the upper panel is an example of a protein that didn't pass this test, as aggregation properties were observed on the leading edge of the gel filtration peak. However, in the lower panel, you see an example of a well-suited protein for SACS analysis that was ultimately subjected to study at the synchrotron. In our 2012 biophysical study, our sec malls analyses were critical to the characterization of a related retroviral integrase protein DNA complex, prototype foamy virus integrase, and its complex with viral DNA, leading to a successful study using small angle X-ray and neutron scattering. We confirmed using sec malls that the integrase protein binds to viral DNA ends in a four integrase to two DNA stoichiometry. We extensively used sec malls to optimize buffer conditions to limit aggregation and polydispersity yielding preparations suitable for SAS analysis and the subsequent atomic modeling of the data. On the panel shown on the left is the sec malls analysis for the PFE in disome and the monomeric PFA integrase alone in solution. Shown in the middle are the one-dimensional profiles obtained from SANS analysis on PFE in disome at the NIST standard, uh, Center for Neutron Research Beamline NG3. On the right, you see a movie showing the reconstruction using SAC SANS data modeled with available atomic structures. Okay, now I've told you about small angle scattering. Next, I'm gonna tell you about dynamic light scattering and how the techniques have helped us evaluate and assess 
lead compounds that bind to HIV integrase. Here in our department, we have a Dynapro Nanostar dynamic light scattering instrument. It allows us to directly assess the size and distribution of particles in a given preparation, providing a rigorous and speedy method to assess aggregation. This particle size can be determined by measuring the random changes in light intensity from a solution and modeling that information using a second order correlation function to derive the diffusion coefficient and allowing for the calculation of hydrodynamic radius and an approximation of mass. When screening compound libraries against the target, in this case integrase, it's not uncommon to realize that many of the hits are going to be false positives because the signal has been affected in an inappropriate way. Many a times, this is because of colloidal aggregation. Simply stated, some molecules will bunch up and self-associated in certain experimental conditions, tickling your screen's output. This can be easily fleshed out using dynamic light scattering. Shown above are distribution plots resulting from the dynamic light scattering for two lead compounds that bind to HIV integrase alone in the buffer solution. The first is a well-behaved small molecule resulting in a distribution with a very small parent radius, no higher order aggregates. The second is not so well-behaved with apparently large radii, much larger than one would expect for a small molecule. Having this instrument has helped accelerate our lead validation efforts by fleshing out molecules that are inappropriately aggregating on their own. For the remainder of my time today, I'm going to tell you about our most recent structural studies of HIV integrase in complex with a new class of drugs known as all innies the allosteric inhibitors of integrase. I'll explain how important SECMOLS was to the breakthrough in the crystallization of the full-length intact protein for the first time, and the assessment of the protein-protein interactions revealed by our new structure. The allosteric inhibitors of HIV integrase, the all innies are potent inhibitors of viral replication that are just entering clinical trials. These molecules are motivated by crystal structures of the LEGF integrase interaction, shown on the left, with the thinking that small molecules could affect early viral replication by blocking this interaction. What ends up being most surprising about the compounds developed is they only modestly interfere with early replication events at the state of integration showing instead their greatest effects late in viral application, dramatically affecting virion maturation via the aberrant multiplication of integrase, which we'll talk about more in a moment. These molecules are generally selected for from screens for their ability to disrupt the binding of the host factor LEGF to integrase between the interaction of the LEGF integrase binding domain to the catalytic core domain of integrase, as shown on the left. Shown on the upper right, it's a LEGF binding site on the catalytic core domain dimer interface. The integrase binds at the dimer interface of the catalytic core domain between helices 3 and 1 of one CCD monomer and 4 and 5 of the other catalytic core domain monomer. Subsequent structure-based design efforts ultimately led to the development of potent compounds from, that target the site and subsequent series of molecules from a number of industrial groups. From these many studies of the catalytic core domain alone, General themes have now been established with regards to the chemical moieties that underlie high affinity binding and specificity. In our studies, we focused on two all innies from GSK and Vive Healthcare, GSK1264 and GSK002. Both compounds share a common tert butoxy acetic acid moiety and a biaryl linkage connecting a substituted chroman to central aromatic ring system. GSK02 is an N-benzyl substituted aza indole that has a methyl substituted chromat, and GSK1264 is an isoquinolinone with a fluoromethyl substituted chromat. By X-ray crystallography, both compounds to the same site on the CCD with bind with high affinity, bearing about 40% of accessible drug surface, similar to that seen for other all any compounds against the catalytic core domain alone. Like other molecules in this class, both GSK1264 and O02 have potent late replication effects, dramatically disrupting HIV particle organization. Shown here are electromicrographs of core particles obtained by Vesa Turkey while still in the Bushman group. What he catalogs here are the virion core particles in immature, mature, and average forms from infected cells treated with GSK1264. 
As reported for other all innies, he found that both drugs greatly affect the distribution of the morphologies of these particles, favoring the defective forms. This property is linked to the ability of the all innies to catalyze the time, temperature, and concentration-dependent aggregation of HIV integrase. This apparent open polymerization can readily be replicated in vitro using purified protein and drug, and monitored using a simple turbidity assay shown in the middle panel. On the y-axis is absorbance of 405 nanometers, and on the x-axis is time. What you can see is turbidity, that is the aggregation of the protein, can be monitored at the absorbance point. This can also be monitored by sec malls, where the stimulation of integrase oligomerization by the allonates can be observed when protein is treated with small molecule, here being stimulated from a monomeric to a dimeric form with GSK-1264. Subsequent analysis by our cohort and others have demonstrated that both the catalytic core domain and the C-term domain of integrase are required for efficient drug-induced polymerization. In line with previous reports, as the C-terminal domain is required for the tetramerization of N and the formation of higher order species. Using sec malls and the turbidity assay described, we can see that the treatment of truncated forms of the protein only resulted in the loss of soluble mass and aggregation when the C-terminal domain is present. As you can see from the left and middle panel series, no effects are seen when the c terminal domain is not present by both sec malls and turbidity assay. Only when the c terminal domain is present do you see a loss of soluble protein mass by sec malls coinciding with the apparent drug-induced aggregation of the protein by a turbidity assay. All of these observations led us to some fundamental questions about how these drugs elicit their effects on the structural level. First, what is the structural basis for this drug-induced aggregation? While the effects of these drugs on integrase are very clear, the structural basis is not entirely clear. Numerous catalytic core domain only structures bound with these small molecules are now available, but none alone reveal the structural basis for the drug induced aggregation, nor why the C terminal domain is required for this apparent open polymerization. Like the strand transfer inhibitors, the genetic barrier for the appearance of resistance mutations against the all NAs is low in virus. Not all of the resistance mutations are readily explained by catalytic core domain only structures. With these questions in hand, we set out to study the full length intact protein with the drug bound using X ray crystallography. But to quote Hamlet, therein lies the rub. We want a co structure of integrase and complex with the drug, but the drug itself promotes the aggregation of an already marginally soluble protein everything you don't want in the formation of an ordered crystal lattice for X-ray crystallography. So we set out to characterize numerous point mutants of integrase by multi-angle light scattering, analytical ultracentrifugation, SACs, and aggregation assays, with the goal of finding forms of integrase that had attenuated response to the drug at the concentrations needed for crystallization, but that didn't undermine drug binding in the formation of the open polymer. We focused our attention on the internal domain mutations, as the internal domain is not required for drug-induced effects, nor the drug binding. Ultimately, it was the Y15A variant of HIV integrase that we ended up working with for crystallization trials. Using both sec malls and sedimentation equivalent analysis, we were able to find that preparations of integrase with this mutation are exclusively dimeric. Shown on the left, the sedimentation equilibrium experiment performed at four degrees Celsius. And you can see in gray are theoretical lines what we expect for the protein in different oligomeric states, with the slope of the line being proportional to the molecular mass. The y-axis is absorbance, the x-axis is the radial position within the analytical centrifugation cell. What you can see is relative to the wild type form of the protein, the integrase Y15A mutation confers a dimeric character to the protein. This is recapitulated in sec malls at room temperature, where we see the elution peak from the Y15A preparations eluding exclusively as dimers. Most importantly, in aggregation assays, we find that the drug-induced polymerization is greatly attenuated, even at elevated drug concentrations with both 1264 and 002. And in experiments I don't show you here, 
The protein Y15A retains the affinity for LEGF IBD, which is required to fold both the NTD and the CCD. Ultimately, this strategy worked. For the first time, we were able to crystallize the full length intact protein, in this case, in complex with the drug GSK1264. The size and the quality of the crystals were improved by iterative seeding. Now, if you dissolve the crystals and run them in an SDS page gel and stain with silver staining, you can see that the intact protein is present. Right. Many, many crystals were screened at the advanced light source at Berkeley. Ultimately, a crystal was found that diffracted outwards to four angstroms, and a full data set was obtained using synchrotron radiation. We were able to solve this structure using molecular replacement with search models of the previously determined structure of the catalytic core domain and C-terminal domain, but notably not the N-terminal domain. The structure was refined using deformable elastic network, DEN, restraints, as implemented in the program CNS. To refine this structure, we used our previously determined high-resolution structure of GSK1264 bound to the in catalytic core domain dimer, as well as the C-terminal domain from the two-domain integrated structure from the 2001 Stroud study as structural restraints. Overall, the electron density was of the quality that allowed us to model all the backbone atoms through the catalytic core domain and C-terminal domain, as well as the drug. Although the page analysis of the gels showed us that we crystallized intact protein, the internal domains were found to be spatially disordered, as there was no anomalous signal from the zinc in the internal domains, nor interpretable electron density that could be assigned to the domain. Before I move on to the anatomy of the drug interface, an important proviso with this type of structure that I'm going to present to you is that this resolution we can only infer side chain positions based on our knowledge of partial structures determined at higher resolution. This is the structure of HIV integrase bound with GSK1264 at 4.4 angstrom's resolution. In the crystal lattice, a dimer of integrase occupies the asymmetric unit, and a lattice work of C terminal domain, catalytic core domain interactions underlie the apparent open polymer. In this configuration, the C-terminal domain from one dimer reaches across to the all any binding site on the catalytic core domain of a neighboring dimer, much akin to a hand gripping a ball. Now, the quaternary Y-shaped arrangement of the dimer is very reminiscent of the two-domain catalytic core domain C-terminal domain crystal structures of HIV presented in the early 2000s. However, this structure is different in that the rotation of the C-terminal domains and the CTD CCD domain interaction itself. This C-terminal domain catalytic core domain interaction has not been previously observed in any prior retrobiotic integrase structure. And this extensive protein-protein interaction in that, excluding the bound inhibitor, over 11,000 square angstroms of solvent accessible surface is buried at each interface. In this movie, we rotate between two orthogonal views of the drug binding site on the catalytic core domain, with the side chains modeled by the DEN refinement using the reference higher resolution structures. GSK1264 is shown bound in the site colored red. For reference, at the center of the screen is the alpha helix C3, which occupies a central position at this interface that we'll discuss more. It includes residues A128, along with side chains 124 and 125, which are the most common reported resistance mutations to occur against the all innies. Now, with the CTD added in gray at the interior of the site, CTD residues 226, 235, 266, and 268 at this interface are highlighted and show an extensive protection of the drug from solvent. With this model in hand, we next asked how, the question of how resistance mutants perturb the drug effects. Cells infected with one of three different strains of HIV were sterilely passaged for 38 rounds and the resulting genotypes cataloged. For each drug, a series of single and multiple point mutants arose which conferred resistance, as evidenced by the increase in EC50s. What I show you here in these respective panels are the resistance mutations as spheres relative to the GSK1264 binding site. As you can see, most of the mutations lie at or near the CTD-CCD interface. And interestingly, the different drugs elicited different 
resistance profiles that overlapped very little despite a very good amount of chemical similarity between the molecules. The mutations fall within one of two categories, either direct disruption of the apparent CTD-CCD interface or mutations which would be predicted to perturb drug positioning and concomitantly the CTD-CCD interface. Alanine 205 is an interesting mutation because it lies far from the binding site at the transition from the CCD to the CTD. We speculate the mutation this site would change the trajectory of the CTDs, affecting the ability of the integrase to form this open polymer. Given what I told you, it would be hypothesized that these resistance mutations act by directly perturbing this interface. To test this, we went back to our solution biophysical methods, including SecMols. We introduced these resistance mutations into our expression construct, purified the proteins, and then characterized the resulting oligomeric properties, the activity of the integrase, and their respective susceptibilities to drug-induced aggregation. Shown are the results in tabular form. In this table, M stands for monomer, D for dimer, and T for tetramer. As predicted from our structure, all the mutants tested showed varying levels of hypooligomeric behavior and attenuated response to drug, despite maintaining the capacity for strand transfer. So, the behaviors are consistent with our new understanding of this drug-stabilized protein-protein interface. Of particular interest are the resistance mutations that arise on the alpha-3 helix of the catalytic coordinate, A128T, W131C, and T124N. Positions 124 and 125 are naturally polymorphic among the thousands of isolates of HIV currently cataloged the Los Alamos database. These sites are shown in blue on the surface of the drug site on the rightmost panel. Indeed, all of the mutations along this interface confer measurable changes in the aluminization and drug sensitivity, which illuminates an important drug discovery consideration when screening for new compounds against isolates of HIV in the general population. Another interesting implication of this structure is the lack of appearance of mutations on the C-terminal domain side of the interface. Since it is well known that most mutants to the C-terminal domain confer defect to integration activities and are not viral application competent, these resistance mutations would not be naturally occurring. To further probe this experimentally, we made mutations of the two large hydrophobics that lie directly at this drug interface, tyrosine-226 and tryptophan-235. As expected, the expressed proteins were all resistant to drug-induced aggregation in the turbidity assay. By both sedimentation equilibrium at 4 degrees Celsius and sec moles at room temperature, the mutants were hyper-oligomeric. In standard strand transfer activity assays, as expected, the mutants were inactive. Here are those same results in tabular form. In addition to the mutations discussed, a naturally occurring C-terminal domain mutation, N222K, is different in nature, as it occurs at a hinge point near the interface, but in a position that directly connects the SH3 fold to the rest of the integrase protein. This mutation is also hypoligomeric and resistant to drug-induced aggregation. Based on our results, all in these stimulate the native oligomeric properties of HIV integrase to form insoluble open polymers. Perhaps the biggest surprise with the all innings that is underscored by our new crystal structure is the unanticipated polymerization and late replication effects. These compounds were selected and designed to interrupt protein-protein interactions between LEGF and integrase, which would be referred to as orthosteric inhibition. However, our results show that the drug very efficiently stabilizes an open polymer of integrase, referred to in drug design as an orthosteric stabilization, akin to what Taxol does in stabilizing microtubule polymerization. This aberrant polymerization appears to underlie its late replication effects on virion maturation. To wrap things up, some take home points on light scattering. First, light scattering is very important for structural biology and drug discovery. For structural biologists performing cryo-EM, X-ray diffraction, NMR, and sac sans light scattering analysis is a key tool for sample validation and success. 
Dynamic light scattering is a very useful tool for filtering out false positive lead compounds that undergo colloidal aggregation. And lastly, SecMOLS is a very robust method for the assessment and validation of protein-protein interfaces observed in oligomeric protein structures. With regards to HIV integrase, I, today I told you about the first crystal structure of an intact HIV-1 integrase in complex with the all-NE GSK-1264. In our structure, the all-NE bridges integrase dimers, leading to the formation of an uncapped open polymer. Resistance mutations reside at or near the all-NE mediated interface. And these mutations also diminish integrase multiplication in vitro and reduce drug-mediated aggregation. All innies stimulate the native oligomeric properties of HIV integrase to form insoluble open polymers. These results together provide insights into drug design approaches for this new class of drugs just entering clinical trials. The HIV work I told you about today is a collaborative effort between the Van Dyne groups and the Bushman groups at the University of Pennsylvania, along with GlaxoSmithKline. I'd also like to thank the beamline operators at the national user facilities across the country, including CHEST, Advanced Light Source in Berkeley, Advanced Photon Source, and Brookhaven National Lands. I'd like to acknowledge the Johnson Foundation Corps for Structural Biology and Biophysics and our funding sources. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kushal, very much. That was a, a really interesting presentation. I think it's uh, amazing how you can pull together information from all these different biophysical techniques to support each other and optimize uh, each other. And um, we're ready now to go into uh, Q&A. And so the first question that we have for you uh, is re with regard to slide 17. So if you'd like to jump back to that one, uh, where you presented the measurements of, uh, of an aggregate, which basically would have corrupted your, your analysis um, by small angle X-ray scattering. And so the question is, um, first, it's actually got two parts. How is it that, that light scattering is able to highlight these aggregates um, where when you don't see them in the UV and it appears that there are no aggregates in UV? And why is it so important? In other words, if the concentration is so low that you don't see them in UV, why are they going to impact your, your X-ray scattering experiments? Oh, thanks for that question. So first, uh, thank you again for this opportunity to uh, speak to you all and talk about my work and the opportunity to talk about how important light scattering has been. Um, with regards to uh, why uh, we can see this aggregation and we can't see the UV, you know, and so many biopolymers, all right, don't have optical activity, first of all. Um, even though, you know, with proteins, you know, naturally usually does, even with tryptophan and tyrosines, you may not see aggregation because light scattering is a wonderfully sensitive technique in a way that X-ray neutron scattering is sensitive, right? The intensity of scattering and these elastic scattering phenomenons um, generally vary with the square of molecular volume. So even small amounts of these higher order species can contaminate the overall intensity of the signal. Uh, and to the second part of your question, uh, could you repeat that again, Dan? Right. So if the concentration is so low that, that basically you don't see much in the UV, how, why are they uh, going to impact your, your X-ray scattering results so much? Right. And so at the end of the day, the overall scattering um, that is uh, recorded is a summation of the, the summation of the intensity from the component parts. Um, and so if you you have your signal of interest, right? It's like kind of like a milkshake. You have raspberries and blueberries, you make a, a, a raspberry blueberry shake, all right? There's no way of deconvoluting um, those two components from the overall scattering. So getting rid of that contaminating component is most important um, in doing these types of analyses. We're looking at the summation, the intensities of component parts. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so the next question is, um, what types of size exclusion columns work best or are most popular to use for SEC models analysis? Oh, so that's a great question. Um, and so with re specific regards to biological macromolecules, if you're a biochemist, biophysicist, structural biologist, your first reflex is to reach for your GE Healthcare, CBDX 200 column, your CBDX 75 column. 
But an important consideration is that media of that nature tends to shed fines. All right, and those fines in solution as they come off the column can actually increase the noise in your light scattering instrument. So if you do choose to choose those uh, columns, uh, make sure that you um, are very deliberate in washing those columns extensively overnight before you get to your light scattering exper experiment. In contrast, the um, silica resin columns, like we use a lot of TSK uh, 3000, 4000 columns for protein separations, um, have a wonderfully low background um, because they're not shedding those types of spines. And so those are very, very useful um, in light scattering analyses like SecMOLs. Great. Um, does, I'm not actually sure about the, the this question, but maybe you, you'll understand it. Does the elution time say anything about the health of a monodispersed protein? I think I think the elution properties do say some things. And so one thing to consider, and I see very frequently, this goes hand in hand with the Sekmol's analysis, is that the breadth of the peak as a function of concentration is usually very diagnostic about self about associating species. For example, if we're looking at a protein protein complex, and we do a series of injections on the Sekmol's column, right, from high to low concentration, you may see a concentration dependent behavior. Um, across the mass profile that mirrors the breadth of the peak coming off the column, all right? Um, and this is not uncommon for modest macromolecular associations on something that's greater of a of, say, one to five micromolar. Uh-huh. Okay, so it, it, it's so doing many about self-association? Exactly. So doing many, many, uh, concentrations for a given sample is usually useful, not only to parse out the sense of aggregation, but also in self-association features. Okay. Uh, so next question is, how, how do you measure the size of protein particles that are below 10 nanometers? And I'm going to add another part to that question. Can you use those measurements um, to constrain your SACS reconstructions? Yes. Um, and to some extent, yeah, so typically when I'm characterizing a macromolecule who's in solution biophysics, I try to bring as much information in as possible, right? Uh, with regards to something that's modest in size, something below 10 nanometers, many proteins fit that. Um, you know, SecMOLs is a very important to see if it's self-associating, all right, in a concentration-dependent fashion. That's usually evidenced by some type of mass profile across the peak. All right, is it a steady, a steadfast flat line or is it something that's sloping upwards with concentration? Um, and I'll use that information a lot in interpreting and restraining our interpretation of results. For example, if I'm doing sedimentation equal to Monero analysis, I'm fitting different association models to a given data set, right? Knowing that I see a certain mass profile in my sec malls data can help me eliminate models to test against sedimentation equal to analysis. Additionally, um, again, some of that biophysical common sense, if I know I have a protein of a certain size in a protein data bank file, and it has a certain retention time, which would be correlated to its Stokes radius, just from using a well-calibrated column with uh, gel filtration standards, and you know a well-determined uh, diffusion coefficient and hydrodynamic radius from maybe perhaps inline DLS with second balls analysis. All of these things should be internally consistent. All right. Um, and so that's something I strive for and look for in any biophysical study I do where I implement two, three, four orthogonal biophysical measures is that everything in the same buffer conditions and perhaps temperature and concentrations should be consistent with a known atomic structure and with the experimental conditions. If it's not, then something's up and I have to explain why that is. And that in turn is very useful for interpreting and constraining the interpretation of monoglo X-ray scattering and neutron scattering data. So there's a lot of self-consistency that's built in and that you can utilize uh, to make sure everything fits together. Exactly. It should be nothing else internally self-consistent. Okay. Quick question here. Do you run the sec malls at room temperature? I always run it at room temperature uh, simply because for convenience more than anything else. Um, we have a lot of complementary analyses that occur at four degrees. So for us, it's a very complementary and uh, uh, routine analysis that we do. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned uh, that with the PFE that you measured a uh, complex with a stoichiometry of four to two. Yes. How, uh, do, that's you, a how do you determine that? You know, and so protein DNA complexes are fun, 
All right, and so if you go to Light Scattering University, you learn about conjugate analysis for composite particles like glycosylated proteins. With protein DNA, you know, um, this is again a situation where we bring in, we bring in a lot of complementary measures to nail down stoichiometry. In the case of sec malls, we have a, what it ends up being a very complementary analysis. And so our mass calculations are, are very strongly reliant upon the refractive index of the macromolecule coming off the column. And, you know, usually for protein, this is very straightforward. It has a DNDC of 0.183, 1.185. But for protein DNA complexes, that DNC, DNDC figure actually becomes uh, a little more complicated. All right, so in the absence of a experimental determination of DNDC of your protein DNA complex, you can do a mass average and then check to see if the resulting mass from the ASTRA analysis is consistent with your interpretation of mass. In our study here, not only did we have sec malls analysis, we also had segregation equilibrium analysis, segmentation velocity analysis, some dynamic light scattering information, and again, we could do a lot of checks to make sure we were nailing down the stoichiometry from different angles. Uh, pun not intended, um, to nail down the, the stoichiometry that we were determining. Cool. Okay, so the next question for you. Can glycosylation patterns or unstructured parts of proteins be identified or differentiated using MALS? Um, I believe so. I think you have to look for certain things. You know, the, the biggest telltale for an unfolded prote protein is simply the retention time, all right? And this is, ends up being... Uh, one of the most confusing issues in gel filtration, you see a peak that's consistent with a dimer, but when you do the MALS analysis, it's actually an extended monomer, right? Likewise, unfolded proteins will have very short retention times versus their folded globular counterparts, right? So that combined with the MALS analysis is a very str a strong um, approach to really nailing down the unfolded character of a extended polymer, unfolded polymer in solution. And, and you, also do, you also do online DLS. Does that play into this? Yes, it does. You know, um, sometimes in practice, you know, depending on the concentrations you're working at and the amount of dispersity of your sample, it may be harder to get that inline DLS to, you know, be really uh, robust versus just taking it to the, our uh, dynamic light scattering instrument upstairs. Um, but that's also very useful because that can give you a diffusion coefficient. You know, if you're familiar with your biophysics, you know, for example, the... Uh, Siegel and Monty equation, the Stokes Einstein equation, where you can combine parameters derived from different techniques, like the S value from sedimentation velocity with the diffusion coefficient from a dynamic light scattering, um, or the hydrodynamic radius from gel filtration with um, S value as well. You can solve these equations using inf information from different techniques to nail down stoichiometry and mass as well. Great. Um, so the next question is very practical, even though it uh, seems to deal with philosophy. What is your philosophy on pre-filtering or centrifuging samples prior to sec models? Oh, uh, religiously. So at the end of the day, uh, for the techniques that I'm doing, especially small angle scattering, if it can't persist long enough to not aggregate during the time course of a gel filtration run, I'm going to be worried. And that's going to be an important experimental consideration with regards to temperature and so forth. Before every injection, I always spin it for 10 minutes uh, in a tabletop centrifuge at four degrees at maximum speed, and then inject the uh, supernatant with it, try not to disturb it. Um, and then with regards to pre-filtering, I don't pre-filter as often because some of the large things I work with will sometimes stick to those filters. So I tend to lean towards the high speed centrifugation first. I've had some samples, like for example, a 660 kil Dalton chaperone protein called HSP-104, that would actually pellet in the high-speed spin. And so in that case there, or the group two intron I mentioned before, I'll actually pass it through a spin filter before injecting it onto the column to mitigate some of those uh, sample loss problems. Okay, well, with a uh, combination of philosophy and religion, we get through everything. Uh, uh, that's all the questions we have for you today. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank you. Really appreciate uh, the time and effort that you put into this. And uh, the, uh, I'm sure everyone in the audience uh, found something valuable and interesting in your presentation. And so with that, we are ready to sign off. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you all.